Tonight, Lee makes landfall with fierce winds and heavy rain, leaving thousands without power. Now a post-tropical cyclone, the storm is heading north. The waves are wicked. As officials urge people to stay home and off the roads. We've had a lot of trees that have been knocked down. In Libya, aging dams and missed warnings. <laughs> Investigators probing if negligence caused more deaths. Plus, a helping who. Everywhere he goes, that basketball has got to go. How a stranger stepped up for a young boy with autism. No one has um, ever done that to me. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Reporting tonight, Heather Wright. Good evening. Packing hurricane force winds, post-tropical storm Lee made landfall this afternoon in Atlantic Canada, bringing heavy rain and coastal flooding to parts of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. In Blue Rocks, Nova Scotia, high waves scattered rocks and other debris across this road, while heavy wind snapped trees and downed hydro wires. At one point, nearly 200,000 customers were without power. The storm steadily weakened as it approached the Maritimes and was not as strong as originally forecasted. Still, officials are urging caution as Lee tracks north. CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Creason Ashkate starts us off. As post-tropical storm Lee made landfall, powerful wind gusts snapped trees and downed power lines. A lot of uh, branches down and um, we're without power, so obviously that has an impact on us too. This transformer exploded in Dartmouth early this morning as more lines went down throughout the region. Stocked up on water and food, uh, now just going to my friend's place to charge up my devices. Six meter high waves crashed into Nova Scotia's southern coast, washing out many low-lying roads. The beach was, it was quite a quite a ball of waves there in bringing the stones over the road and, and it, it blocked a road off down there and a pole was on fire in Clark in uh, Stony Island. Police blocked the entrance to Peggy's Cove, keeping people away from potential dangers. Stay away from the water's edge for your own safety and for the safety of first responders. In Lawrencetown, Lee spewed sea foam into the air, making it look like a wet winter wonderland, if only for a second. We wanted to come out and see the waves. We knew it was going to be pretty gusty out, so we wanted to see the pretty big waves. Despite the warnings to stay away from the waves, some still showed up when the conditions were a little milder at times. This one's not that bad compared to, well, I mean, so far, compared to what others ones we've had, I think. But it's still, still quite windy out. We're really tremendously thankful that it didn't get us the way we thought it would. There were some downed trees and power lines in Yarmouth, the mayor was predicting conditions to be much worse. We expected a lot of storm surge on Water Street um, because we're surrounded. We've got the highest tides in the world and we had the high tide already. Another one tonight, so we'll see what happens. Nova Scotia isn't out of the woods just yet as tens of thousands remain without power and the full scope of Lee's impact on the province won't be seen until Sunday and into next week. Heather. All right, thanks, Creason. In Nova Scotia tonight, in neighboring New Brunswick, there were similar scenes of strong winds and flooding. Century-old trees, no match for this storm. CTV's Heather Butts is in St. John. Lee blew into the Maritimes as a post-tropical storm, but there was no doubt its hurricane-force winds and pounding rain would cause problems even hours before it made landfall. Massive waves lashing New Brunswick's Fundy coastline as the outer band warned of its arrival. The waves were wicked. Like, I, I loved it. I think it's, like, really peaceful, even though I'm soaked. People here were told to stay home, though some couldn't help but come catch a glimpse for themselves. Oh, the waves are going to be huge. It's just absolutely stunning to see it and crashing over. The water level along the Bay of Fundy playing a huge role in how this story plays out. High tide during the most intense part of the storm, having an impact not only on on coastal erosion, but inland flooding. Downpours with slow drainage cause some localized flooding in St. John, roadways and basements. One homeowner even getting additional support, knowing there's more rain overnight. We just went and got a, a third sump pump, 
So I think, I'm hopeful that we're prepared for that and we get a generator too. Lee was felt right across New Brunswick, with Fredericton facing heavy bands of rain, some parts of the city inundated with water. Ferocious winds gusting to 85 kilometers per hour along the Bay of Fundy. Century-old trees couldn't stand up to Lee's strength. You can replace them with small trees, but you know, that gives a beautiful cover. That's what we're looking for now. Lee will continue making its way up the Bay of Fundy overnight through southern New Brunswick and then the Gulf of St. Lawrence on Sunday. Still plenty of time for Maritimers to endure the full wrath of Lee's whipping wind and rain. Heather? All right, Heather Butts in New Brunswick for us tonight. South of the border, there's at least one reported fatality linked to this storm. A man in Maine was killed after a large limb fell on his vehicle. The White House has ordered federal assistance to the state to help with the cleanup, and thousands remain in the dark tonight. Crews from as far away as Tennessee are en route to get the power back on. Some positive news tonight from the wildfire-ravaged Northwest Territories. More than a month after being forced to flee Hay River, residents are returning home. The town's council made the decision last night to begin allowing people to return this morning. Officials say the nearby fire is contained, but an evacuation alert remains in effect, meaning they could be told to leave again on short notice. Rescue teams in Libya continue the painstaking task of searching for bodies almost a week after more than 11,000 people were killed in catastrophic flooding. Now, rising anger is adding to the suffering as prosecutors open an investigation into the role negligence may have played in the disaster. CTV's Judy Trent reports. New video of torrents sweeping away cars, buildings and lives following a massive storm. The water rushed in when two dams collapsed. Devastation that may be the result of human recklessness. The prosecutor said the investigation will probe local authorities and previous governments for negligence. The investigation was launched after Libya's prime minister admitted the dams may not have been properly maintained. More than 11,000 people have been killed, hundreds are being buried in mass graves, while thousands more are missing. This man survived a four-story wall of water and has been searching the shoreline and streets of Susa for relatives. I just want to find my brother and his family and bury them. They are under the rubble. While in Derna, another survivor struggles to cope. Only God knows what we're going through, he says. No one helps you, not even the government. Some international help has arrived, including these Italian firefighters. Meanwhile, the United Nations is redeploying a disaster coordination team from Morocco's earthquake zone to Libya. The UN says the death toll could double. This is a tragedy in which climate and capacity has collided to cause this terrible, terrible tragedy. Compounding the problem, eastern Libya is ruled by the military regime of Khalifa Haftar. His administration isn't recognized by other nations, and it's unclear how much help he can secure. Haftar's rival government in Tripoli controls most of Libya's money. The World Health Organization says it has sent enough humanitarian aid to the region to help 250,000 people, including medicine, surgical supplies and body bags, while Canada has pledged $5 million. But this humanitarian effort could be hampered by political divisions. Heather. Absolutely heartbreaking. Judy Trin in Ottawa tonight. Thanks, Judy. The E. coli outbreak in Calgary linked to daycare centres is growing. Six more facilities have now been closed after new cases emerged. Alberta's chief medical officer of health says the move is just a precaution, but parents say climbing cases have them worried for their family's health. CTV's Tim Brook has the latest. The order came down late Friday night. Six more childcare centers closed because of an E. coli outbreak. Another center, already closed once and reopened, is being shuttered for a second time. The province says every facility has connections to the centers involved in the original outbreak almost two weeks ago. Identifying the exact source and how things unfolded is like trying to find a needle amongst a field of haystacks. As the numbers climb, in Crossfield, Alberta, Tegan Rogers hosted a birthday party. Are those your nights? Are these your nights? Mm. 
His mom says two-year-old Rhett got E. coli last October. It led to further complications with HUS. Then she says liver failure and dialysis. He was in severe pain. He cried for like days. Sorry. It was a nightmare. Rhett was in the hospital for weeks. Today, his family says he has chronic kidney disease and developmental delays. Rogers believes that's part of what made this week's news so hard to take. I felt sick for those families. I felt angry. Christina McAleer says her daughter also battled HUS. You don't really get closure from this. You know, they told me she'll need to be tested probably every year for the rest of her life. McAleer has launched a support group for those parents currently being affected, and she wants everyone to watch for E. coli warning signs because she wishes she noticed them sooner. I didn't know anything about it until she was in hospital. The central kitchen linked to the original outbreak remains closed. The newly shuttered sites will need to be cleaned and sanitized before they can reopen. Tim Brook, CTV News. Calgary. Billed as the largest gathering of progressives in Canada in over a decade. Today, current and former world politicians gathered in Montreal to discuss some big ideas and if they can solve some even bigger problems. Here's CTV's Kelly Gregg. The paradox is that you stop. It was a discussion on lofty goals, but the leaders gathered in Montreal say good intentions aren't enough for voters faced with rising bills and worries. Progressives can come and talk about, oh, we need to build a better world. If we're not responding to where people are on a daily life, then we're not going to be connecting with them. If democracy fails to deliver uh, solutions to everyday life, job security housing uh, all of that uh, you lay the terrain open you know for extremes prime minister justin trudeau and other self-proclaimed progressive world leaders met in an invitation only summit one issue common among them the high cost of living we are seeing high inflation uh, very high uncertainty among people in, in North America. We are seeing homelessness rising and rising everywhere. And while they propose progressive solutions, the big question is the ballot box. The latest Nanos poll shows Trudeau trailing the Conservatives' Pierre Polyev. Santa Marin's party was ousted from power in the spring. And last year, Sweden's Magdalena Andersson was defeated by a new centre-right government. Former New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says part of their problem is cutting through misinformation found online, but also it's on the leaders themselves to show voters why their needs and the ideas discussed here aren't so different. It really matters that people see, I think, their leaders acknowledging that things are hard. And we can't stand there next to a dumpster on fire and not acknowledge that it's burning behind us. And without that, they say it will open the door to cynicism and only add frustration with governments to people's already growing list of problems. Kelly Gregg, CTV News, Montreal. Contract talks are revving up between striking auto workers and Detroit's big three car makers, with negotiators calling today's discussions reasonably productive. Nearly 13,000 workers at three plants have walked off the job, and the union says the strike will grow if their demands for higher wages and more benefits aren't met. This is the first time in the United Auto Workers' 88-year history that it has walked out on all three companies at the same time. In Canada, negotiations are also ongoing between Unifor, the union representing auto workers, and Ford, with a deadline set for Monday at midnight. Coming up, demanding change one year later. Demonstrations across the world on the anniversary of Masa Amini's death. Plus, a hooping hero, how a stranger's kindness is helping one basket at a time. It's been 365 days since a 22-year-old Kurdish woman died after being arrested by Iran's morality police for not wearing her hijab, according to government standards. Masa Amini's death sparked widespread protests in Iran and around the world, marking the biggest threat to the regime in decades. 
Today, thousands gathered in dozens of cities to say her name and demand change. Here's CTV's Manitoba Bureau Chief, Jill Nakashan. Say her name. In 70 cities across the globe and right here in Canada, Masa Amini was remembered. The young woman died following her arrest by Iran's morality police for improperly wearing her hijab. Masa was one of the many they've killed, tortured and put in prison and uh, taken for custody, and, uh, she, but she was the last drop. As people around the world took to the streets in her name in Iran, a continued crackdown. Members of the country's paramilitary Revolutionary Guard were secretly recorded patrolling the streets, searching for what they called illegal demonstrations. Still, some bravely tried. Small sporadic protests. It was reported Amini's father was detained by police as he visited her grave. He was later released. Nothing like the mass protests seen last year. The worst political unrest in Iran in four decades. A movement that caught the attention of the world, the most scrutiny the regime had seen since the Islamic Revolutionary Guard was implicated in the downing of Flight PS-752. The plane was hit by two missiles after taking off from Tehran's airport in January 2020. 176 people were killed, including 55 Canadians and 30 permanent residents. My fiancé was on that plane, Dr. Farooq Khadim. Masa Amini is a famous name, but there are many, many people who have never yet heard their names, who have been brutally killed under this regime. An anniversary of remembrance to become an annual call for change. Demonstrators say Canada needs to designate Iran's Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization. The federal government instead announced it is sanctioning six more Iranian officials now banned from entering Canada. Jill McIshawn, CTV News, Winnipeg. Comedian and social media influencer Russell Brand has been accused of rape and sexual assault, allegations he denies. The alleged incidents took place between 2006 and 2013 and involved four women, one of whom says she was 16 years old at the time. In a video posted online, Brand says his relationships were all consensual and maintains he's always been transparent about his promiscuous lifestyle. And to see that transparency metastasized into something criminal that I absolutely deny makes me question, is there another agenda at play? The allegations were reported by three British news organizations. Police in the UK say they have not received any formal complaints, but are aware of the allegations. Still ahead, the housing crisis and a spike in homelessness. Quebec's growing issue and plans to solve it. The rising cost of living is leaving more Canadians without a place to call home. A new report from Quebec's Public Health Institute shows the number of people experiencing homelessness in the province has nearly doubled since 2018. CTV's Jean-Via Beauchemin on the startling figures. A snapshot of life on Quebec's streets paints a stark picture of homelessness in this country. Researchers report a spike since 2018. Twice as many people, like Francine, are now in dire need of a place to call home. I'm the oldest woman over here. And it's not my place. I'm looking for an, uh, an apartment. So we're not so bad. A count of what researchers call visible homelessness concludes at least 10,000 Quebecers are now living on the streets. That's twice as many as five years ago. Though the true figure, they say, is considerably higher. 67% are men. Indigenous, LGBTQ+, and immigrant people are overrepresented, and so are those previously in the care of youth protection. And 15% became homeless during the pandemic and say it played a part in their current situation. These are our community members that are literally dying in the streets, and why isn't anyone doing anything about it? Governments at all levels say they're addressing the issue. Ottawa announced a tax break on construction of new rental apartments this week. And Calgary has just recently opened up 45 new affordable housing units. But the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says 3.5 million new homes need to be built by 2030 to restore affordability. And advocates say mental health resources are stretched to the limit. Despite a lot of really good effort, 
And despite the fact that there have been some successes in how helping people get housed, what we've been seeing is that there's more entries than there are exits from the experience of homelessness. At a summit in Quebec City this week, leaders explored new solutions. For instance, stricter policies on investing in social and affordable housing. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. After the break, bonding over broken baskets. We leave you tonight with a story about the big impact of a small act of kindness. Here's CTV's Adam Sawatsky on the priceless gift, Straight from the Heart. When her son started showing interest in basketball this year, after a lifetime of suffering from serious medical issues and being on the autism spectrum, Betty Wade was overjoyed. It impacts my heart hugely because it makes him feel like he's an everyday kid. When her 13-year-old wasn't shooting hoops in the hallway, he was playing at the park. Everywhere he goes, that basketball has got to go. Makes me happy. So when Jonathan received a gift certificate from a sick kid's charity, nobody was surprised he bought a basketball hoop to play outside his home. It was the love of his life. But then Betty couldn't have been more shocked to arrive home from work the other day and find it broken at the end of the driveway. He was really disappointed. When Betty was told who was to blame for the accident, she contacted that person's supervisor. Right away, very apologetic, and leave this in my hands and see what we can do. When Betty heard back from that supervisor, he apologized for taking so long, revealing he had been in the hospital with his wife. We just received some bad news. She has breast cancer, and I thought... Oh, my God. The now single mom of three couldn't help but recall when she heard the diagnosis that led to losing her husband to cancer and couldn't believe this man was now asking to drop by with a gift for her son. So I ran out and got him some flowers. Well, Betty bought a bouquet, hoping it might put a smile on his wife's face. The man, who wishes to remain anonymous, presented Jonathan with this new basketball and that new hoop that proved way bigger and better than the original. There's no words. I mean, he's fighting something so dearly in his life, and he's making such kind acts in our life. And while Jonathan couldn't be more grateful, that man went above and beyond so he could play his beloved b-ball like never before. Because I've ne no one has um, ever did that to me. Ever given such a big gift. It just felt nice. Adam Swatsky, CTV News, Nanaimo. The kindness of strangers. That is it for us tonight. I'm Heather Wright. For Sandy and all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Have a great night. Five crucial questions to expose the truth. Who's at risk? What needs to change? When will justice be done? There was actually a plot to kill you. Where's the proof? Why did this happen? Watch W5 Saturdays at 7 on CTV.